Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, what I want to try to do, uh, what I want to try to do this evening is to draw together some threads because I'm very aware that most of you here already think in a certain way. You will already be aware of certain information, but sometimes it helps to sort of see how patterns form around that. And I am well known for investigating things like the unexplained. Uh, and more peripheral fringe stuff as well as this. But I'm going to keep this evening more to what you might want to call everyday issues. I won't say real world, because real world is a matter of opinion, isn't it? But the everyday issues, with one section where we will perhaps just step back and look at the, the wider issues of maybe what these times are about. And I've already heard Margaret allude to that uh, in some of the very interesting notices she was giving at the beginning. So. Most of all, I want to see how we can get a handle on what is going on. When we talk about the global agenda, and people in our world often will talk about the global agenda, the, what do we mean when we say, well, let's deal with it? How can we deal with it? How can we change it? Uh, and how do we come to terms with the reality of the way things are? So that's really the thread that I'm going to take. And I'm going to begin by taking you back a few months to the rioting that we had here in England. And I know many of you will, of course, have uh, opinions on this, as you rightly should do. What was very interesting when this trouble erupted was that it hadn't really been seen coming, I think, by most people. Now, maybe people like ourselves weren't surprised at all, but there was a feeling of surprise, of shock. Despite everything that was going on around the world and the Arab uprisings and all of that, it was very interesting when you'd hear people like David Cameron talking about all of that, that they didn't seem to think that it could happen here. Which, of course, you know, many people have been saying for years, there's going to be social unrest here. Because there are so many issues that aren't being dealt with. And they're trying to sweep them under the carpet, and inevitably they're going to come back to haunt us. But what was odd about the riots was that these seemed to come from somewhere slightly different. And as you will have heard over and over again, it was almost nihilistic. It was hard to really know what point these people were making. Now, there was the shooting, first of all, which initially sparked it. And as we now know, uh, you know, the man they shot was unarmed. So they were asking for trouble from the start. But that aside, much of the trouble that erupted seemed to have very little to do with that. And we just had people looting because they could and taking things because they thought they would get away with doing so in the atmosphere that had suddenly sparked off. And you will all know the ins and outs of this, but one image that I thought stuck with me was uh, this image here, which some of you will have seen in the news, of, you know, the toy horse in the road with all the fire and all the rioting going on. And it's not entirely a wooden horse, bits of it are, and I just thought, well, that's quite an interesting motif because, of course, a large number of people think that this whole riot event was, if you like, a wooden horse of Troy event. This was bringing something in which actually suited a lot of people for this to occur. And this is something that I think a lot of people feel very strongly because you cannot deny that on the first night of the rioting, there was a very strange behaviour from the police. Because in some places, particularly in London, which is not so far away from where I am, um, the police hung back. There's no question that they stood there in their lines and literally watched what was going on. Uh, many people feel that there was, if you like, uh, an order, a stand-down order. Have well, we heard that before? But to literally allow this to spark, to allow this to grow, because, of course... The measures that have come in since the riots have suited a lot of people. Now, what I thought was very interesting, and some of you will have seen this, um, was that just a week or so after that, there was a special question time on BBC One. And one very brave woman made a point that you wouldn't normally hear on the likes of question time. And I'm going to play this to you. Now, I have to warn you, I thought we were going to be in a slightly smaller room, so the speakers were a bit small. So you might have to strain your ears here, okay? But um, I'm going to play you what one woman in the uh, audience asked the panel. And I want you to obviously listen to what she's got to say, but also listen to the response around her from the audience and look at the blank looks of the panellists, okay? So I'm hoping you'll be able to hear this. 
So have a listen to this. Um, I put it to you that the decision was taken deliberately to have lax policing in order to, after the events that happened, push more rules forward to stop um, protest, to stop working class having a voice and to uh, stop... Go on, finish your point. I, I think that I, I drove around many areas of South London on the Monday nights where I live and there weren't any police anywhere and I cannot believe in five different, quite large areas there were absolutely no police. I saw crimes being committed. I cannot believe there were none. All right. It was deliberate. It was deliberate. The woman on the, on the ground. So, in a way, she voiced what many people believe, of course. And good on her for voicing it, because you can see there the ridicule that she was facing. You can hear people saying, rubbish, rubbish, because people have conditioned their programme to deny any opinion of that ill. So, yeah, I mean, there she is. She, she is effectively putting out conspiracy theory on BBC One, uh, which you're not meant to do, of course, because it doesn't exist, going into the BBC, or only has theory. And the, what I thought was a shame was, I mean, you can see Dimbleby immediately moved on. Yeah. There was no response. The panel were not allowed to respond. And if you look at their faces, they weren't going to respond anyway, because you can tell this is either off their radar or they know damn well they can't go there, because it touched on something that was a little bit too near the knuckle. So, a lot of people feel that what happened with the riots was a deliberate act. Now, maybe the initial spark wasn't, but the way they handled it was. It's like they thought, you know, this is a good opportunity. Let this go big. Uh, because of, by doing that, of course, then we have the response. So, Theresa May stands up a few weeks later and, uh, you know, once again it's, right, get rid of the Human Rights Act, you know, do this, do that. There are problems with the Human Rights Act. We know this, there are some problems, but as soon as you start saying that we're going to withdraw human rights, the trouble is, if they don't make very clear boundaries, where does it end? What about when it's your human rights they simply want to take away? And there are other things, more draconian policing, as we heard earlier on from Margaret. You know, there are laws going through all the time, you know, there are more and more restrictions, the small print changes and the riots have been used to justify more of that, to justify a more draconian police state. So were the riots essentially allowed to spark as large as they did for this very reason? And of course, many people believe so, whatever other agendas may have been going on. But where have we heard this before? Remember this? Yes. Prince Charles and Camilla, the year before. So there was a student protest. Students at last have found the voice. And funnily enough, on the same night as the student protests in London, Prince Charles and uh, the Duchess of Cornwall are being taken to a film premiere. And funnily enough, the police didn't think, actually, it's not a very good idea to send that car into the student protests. Now, they argue that some of the protesters peeled off from the main march and that's why the car got surrounded and, as you can see, damage and all the rest of it. But come on, come on. You know there's one of the biggest marches that's been in London for a long, long time. And they didn't think, you know, maybe we should just tell them not to go to the film that night. A lot of people think that they were deliberately allowed to be caught in this because, of course, what that did was, the next day, it took all the focus off the very real issues of the students and put it all onto, look what those nasty students have done to the prince. And it, and it diluted the impact of what the real genuine protesters were trying to do. Now, there will always be the accusation that any protest is being manipulated, and we're going to come to that. But the fact is, a lot of the people on the streets were there for very real reasons. They, they had a genuine grievance that they felt they wanted to air. And certainly this incident was used to... I think, sideline some very serious issues. And, I mean, this man, yeah, you have to say, was to some degree responsible for why those students were out on the streets in the first place. I mean, Nick Clay, where did it all go so wrong? I mean, there he was, just uh, you know, a year and a half ago, with, with you know, poll ratings on the level of Winston Churchill. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Approval ratings, they're the highest since Churchill. And then, then it, how did it go so quickly from that to this? <laughs> Clegzilla, as some posters called it. And, I mean, the thing is, 
the Liberal Democrats have mounted a brilliant campaign in the run-up to the general election, which some of you will remember. Uh, this was it, and I'll, I'll save you the soundtrack, but there we are, no student tuition fees. Now, what they're doing here was making fun of all the broken promises of the previous governments. There's a brilliant piece of film, and they flatter around, and then Nick Clegg wanders around and says, all the other parties have lied to you, but we won't lie to you. We will stick to our word. And you will recall, he even signed a pledge that we will not raise tuition fees. And of course, well, you know what happened. Well, the thing is, there were a lot of people at this point, particularly young people, who thought for the first time they might vote. And that maybe it might make a difference. Clegg himself had certainly made an impact in the TV broadcast where they were debating and people felt that he was a man that might actually stand up for principles. But of course, when it came to the crunch and they had to go into uh, power with the Tories, well, as you know, of course, all that fell away, as he usually does. But this was a particularly large drop because the promises were so big. And I think that if the Liberal Democrats were serious about wanting to ever mean anything in politics again, they should have stuck to their guns. And they should have risked the coalition uh, and stood by what they'd said about the tuition fees. Because, yes, the tuition fee system may be needed sorting out. But what they've done is basically just make it now even more elitist than it was. So this is why you had the people out on the streets. Finally, students who've gone very quiet for many years. I mean, go back to the 80s and, you know, the young ones. You think of the, the kind of student stereotypes. The protesting student was a big one. They'd have gone. And whether they'd just been neutered by, you know, all the other things they had to worry about and the debt that was already big enough or what, I don't know. But suddenly they found their voice. And it was building up. But I thought that this was important. And whether you agreed with what the students were saying or not, they were standing up for what they believed in. Now, when it turned to what you might term rioting, of course, that allowed the media especially to say, oh, well, look at them, they're all just thugs throwing fire extinguishers. But of course that was only the, the tiniest part of it. And that didn't do credit to those who had genuine issues that were trying to air them in a way that was meaningful. And of course, you know, this really is just the beginning of something. I and mean, you can all feel, and you all know, how strongly some people feel about issues that are not being addressed. Uh, and that is why we're going to get more of this. But I was very encouraged when, just a little bit after that, we had the business of the forests. Do you remember this? Yeah. I thought that this was a very important point, that cutting a long story short, what the government wanted to do was to sell off our forest land to basically outside investors. So basically what you're doing is selling off England, or Britain, if you want to go the whole hog, to anybody that wanted a piece. Now, what I thought was very slapdash of the government to even propose this, was that they couldn't see why people felt it mattered. A lot of people felt in their guts this was really wrong because there's something about the British, we're very attached to the land. Okay, you might live in a city maybe, but we've still got a strong feeling about the land. Look back at the old British myths, the Arthur myths. It's about the land, you know, it's Scalibur. And Arthur is the land, and the land is Arthur, and the people are Arthur. You see what I mean? So what they were doing, by taking away that, so we're going to take this land away from you, actually. It's not yours anymore. We're just going to sell it to the highest bidder. That was a real affront to the spirit of the people, and people felt this very strongly. Now, as it turns out, they did a U-turn, and they decided not to. Now, were they really listening to the people, or were, as some people think, actually, they never had any intention of going ahead with this. Some people, even, even Private Eye magazine, think that. I'm not saying something, that it was a sort of a ruse to then sort of make it look like they do sometimes change their minds on some things. But nonetheless, it identified how they appeared, the government appeared not to be listening to something that many people felt very strongly in their guts. Now that is something that we see an awful lot of. And this is where we kind of get into the realms of, does the media, never mind the government, does the media reflect what people really think? And I don't believe that it does. I mean, take another big issue. Right. The global warming issue. Now, I am not a climatologist, okay? So I don't know if it's real or not real, but I can see there's a serious debate to be had. 
and that there are serious climatologists who are qualified professionals who are questioning global warming, who feel that the whole thing is misconceived, we haven't understand it, it's too early to say what the climate's really doing. So to me, there's a debate you've got to have, and you've got to be able to openly have it, and government policy shouldn't be built on one thing when there's still so much uncertainty. I neatly say about the climate gate emails, I mean, you know, whether you believe in global warming or not, I mean, there was an absolute thread there of we must not tell the people about the uncertainty. And well, that's not right, because what you're doing is treating people as very stupid. And with that in mind, I mean, on the BBC Breakfast uh, News one morning, uh, they had Simon Fanshawe, TV pundit, on, and a new poll had come out saying that around 60% of British people do not believe in global warming which I believe is still pretty much the poll now. So for all the propaganda, 60%, whether you agree with them or not, do not accept it. Now, that's quite a statement, because what you're saying there is that an awful lot of people have a, a strength of feeling about something. What was Simon Fanshawe's response to this? He said this. He said, well, we live in a global village, so it's inevitable you will get global village idiots. So his response to 60% of the population is, you're idiots. <laughs> Not, actually, isn't that really interesting, so many people feel this, we'd better investigate this. No, utter dismissal. And that's what's wrong. And that is why people get pissed off. Because even, it doesn't matter what side of the, the climate divide you're on, if people have denied a debate when there's so much evidence, you're going to get people feeling resentment. And you look at some of the people that challenge it. I mean, there's some very mainstream people. I mean, some of you would have seen David Bellamy talk at some of the Alternative View conferences in the last couple of years that he and Crane uh, organised. So, you know, he's come out and said, I just do not see that the science supports this. As soon as he started saying that publicly, of course, he started to lose all the TV jobs. Mm -hmm. And as far as his media profile was concerned, he lost his credibility. Nigel Lawson, now well, think what you want about him, you know, he's been a critic of the whole global warming propaganda. And in fairness, his book about it just makes some very good points that even if you believe in global warming, the way they are trying to deal with it is all wrong. But then you've got other people like Peter Taylor, who was an environmental advisor to the EU and the UN. Read his book, Chill. This book, Chill, I think is a very strong case that we've completely misunderstood the whole climate change business. Um, he and his colleagues noticed that whenever they came up with data that did not support the global warming model, it was always sidelined as instrument error. And he began to realise this was going on too many times. And he got sick of it and realised they had already made their minds up. And all they were interested in was data that supported global warming. And then, of course, after a while, the only funding you get is that which goes for what the government wants. So it completely skews the statistics. So when they say, well, all our scientists say global warming is real or whatever, well, they would, because nobody else has been funded to look at the other side of it. So this is the problem. Getting to a serious sort of balance with this is very difficult. And this is just an example that I'm using. And in particular, I want to talk here about the way the media responds to the fact that there are debates that need to be had. Now, most of you here will not need to hear anything more about 9-11. I'm not going to go on about the ins and outs of 9-11. Suffice to say, if anybody in here still believes the official story, for God's sake, go and find out more. Okay. Uh, and the, well, you've got lots of stuff at the back there. Uh, we've got a table there in the corner. There's some 9 11 websites on it. Just go and explore. Because the evidence is overwhelming that, at the very least, somebody on the inside of American intelligence and who knows where else must have pulled the strings to make these attacks as successful as they were. And I don't want to go into the ins and outs, but if you want to know more and you fancy a two hour drive, I'm speaking in Brighton at the uh, Brighton. Constitution Club on Monday, just about 9-11, because there's so much to say. But the point I want to make here is the calibre of those that question it are, is really high. I mean, you've got people like Richard Gage, a qualified architect. This guy knows what he's talking about. You go online and you look at the scholars for 9-11 Truth, 
Uh, and indeed, architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, you'll see there's a, a video of a presentation he gives that will categorically show you there's no way those towers fell down without the addition of explosives. Uh, ditto Steve Jones, who I see his quote in here. Um, Steve Jones is a man who lost his job at his university because he started to question the physics of 9-11. You're not meant to do that if you're in certain jobs. And yet this is a man who's absolutely uh, knowledgeable about his field of interest. And David Ray Griffin, well, think what you like about his politics. His logical scrutiny of the official story of 9-11 is so devastating because he just points out the inherent contradictions in their own words and lets them demolish themselves. His book about Building 7, for instance, uh, you know, which you would all know fell down for no reason whatsoever, <laughs> is them st read one chapter and you know immediately that the American government and the National Institute of Standards and Technology has committed scientific fraud. There is no question about that by trying to pretend that it fell down just due to fire. So there are more people. There's lots of other people out there doing campaigning, but the point is these people, you would think, deserve to be taken seriously, and yet... How much coverage do they get in the mainstream? Not much. What do we get instead? Well, what we get instead is things like the BBC Conspiracy Files program a few weeks ago, the anniversary, which omitted all the key reasons why people question 9-11 or demolished it in the most pathetic of ways. Like one of their arguments about uh, the finding of particles of thermate inside the dust from the collapse of the towers was, oh, it's paint. That's all it is. You think that these physicists didn't immediately think it might be paint? Well, just check that first. It was one of the first things they ruled out. The BBC says, no, all they found was paint, not high explosives. It's quite a lot of difference, really. So these are the kind of things that we're up against. And the kind of people that we're up against are interesting characters like this. <laughs> David Aronovich, author of Voodoo Histories, which basically debunks all conspiracy theories without actually addressing the evidence, oddly enough. Uh, Polly Toynbee has quite happened to mouth off against 9-11 truthers, and yet when I went to uh, a lecture that Polly gave uh, in uh, Lewis in Sussex some years ago, I stood up uh, in questions and I asked her, I said, well, can you justify your comments as to why you've dismissed those that question 9-11? To which she just went, oh, well, I don't think we, we don't need to talk about that today. That was it. There was no engagement. She didn't want to have an argument. She doesn't even know what she's talking about. That's the problem. They won't engage with the evidence. And ditto, this man here, George Monbiot. Oh. He's done some very good things in the past for environmental stuff and that. But, unfortunately, when it comes to this kind of world, he doesn't want to know. And, you know, he very famously in his newspaper column described 9-11 truthers as morons. Prone to an epidemic of gibberish. Now, when you start having to throw insults out, you know they've lost the argument. These are not people who are trying to engage in any kind of meaningful discussion. They are literally sinking to insults. And that tells you an awful lot. But these are the people that get the coverage. You won't very often see Steve Jones or David Ray Griffin on a TV discussion show, but you'll see this bunch there virtually every other day. Media is entirely skewed by pundits who support the status quo. And I know it's obvious on one level, but that doesn't make it right. And this is the problem that we have. I mean, another issue we've had is uh, alternative medicine. Now, the thing about it is, I mean, this is something that many people have used for, you know, for centuries to the year dot. And yet, if you were to uh, put on Radio 4, Radio 4, if you want to know what the, the mainstream propaganda is, just put Radio 4 on and you'll soon know. Radio 4 has been leading a campaign against alternative medicine in particular uh, for years. Uh, the, the Today program in the morning is a good one. Virtually once a month, like clockwork, there will be another debunk of alternative medicine. Homeopathy doesn't work. High-dose vitamins will kill you. You know, not mentioning any of the drugs that kill people every week, of course. Uh, and all of this stuff. I mean, it is astonishing, isn't it? Uh, is it something like, oh, I don't know, you know, a million people a year die in America alone due to misdiagnosis or normal drugs? Uh, they can't prove that one person has died of complementary medicine, and yet there's a constant call for control. We need to stamp out this dangerous practice. 
And so you get these continual uh, reports coming out saying there's nothing to alternative medicine, it's all scientific fraud. Well, we can show some better examples of scientific fraud as we've just mentioned. But, I mean, the problem we have here, and Ian Crane has done a lot of very good work with this, is that we're up against a huge body like the Codex Alimentarius. And if you haven't already heard about them, they're essentially a division of the uh, World Health Organization, at the Food Safety Division. <laughs> and their meetings, and you can see them there, are basically attended by lobbyists from all the big pharmaceutical firms and all the big food firms. There is a tiny, weeny contingent of people from the alternative medicine world. And thank God that they go there, because they, in their own tiny way, have managed to hold back a lot of the new restrictions that are coming in, courtesy of Codex. They are basically making it impossible to buy uh, various products in such high doses anymore, and yet sometimes it leaves you with the legal amount that you'll be able to buy within the next two years will be so small as to not be worth taking anyway. They are also weakening the limits on, for instance, what can be labelled organic. So they're saying, well, what you normally would label organic today, they're going to weaken it so that you could have a lot more non-organic material in it and not have to label it. Same with GM, same with genetically modified stuff. So they're weakening the rules, which will then in the end make a mockery of the whole thing. The biggest thing that they're doing is that they are changing the rules so that if you claim that anything has a medicinal value, even mint or garlic, herbs that we've traditionally used, as soon as you say that has a medicinal value, you have got to run clinical trials. Mm. Now, some of these little companies that produce these little homeopathic tablets or whatever, they haven't got the money to do that. It costs thousands to go through this. Who has got the money? Uh -huh. The pharmaceutical companies. And so they're going to take it over and they will just basically dominate it and take away anything that might help you in this area. And that's the problem. And for those people that believe that there is a systematic attempt to weaken our collective immune system and make us full of more chemicals and terrible things, well, here's some very good evidence. Thank God we have people like this. There are people fighting you. And here we see... Mr. Ian Crane himself, he won an award from the National Health Federation just a while back uh, for the work he's done in raising awareness of the National Health Federation. Scott Tetz uh, of the National Health Federation and Robert Verkirk, the Alliance for Natural Health. These people are there, out there trying to call attention to it. The Kirk's bunch, who don't necessarily all agree with each other, but they're all fighting essentially the same side. The Kirk actually goes to the Codex meetings. And uh, he actually is campaigning, you know, for good things. So, I'm using this as an example, however, of, you know, how there's all this going on. Are you going to hear about that in the mainstream? I don't think so. And the problem is this instead is how people like Ian and Scott are characterised. You know, well, they're just conspiracy theorists. That phrase, conspiracy theorists, uh, is used, of course, dripping with sarcasm in the media. Actually, there's nothing wrong with being a conspiracy theorist. I am, by definition, a conspiracy theorist because over the years I have theorised over potential conspiracies. So what? But, of course, it's very clever in the media. They'll say, oh, well, that's just conspiracy theory. Uh, and in people's minds, that becomes sort of the sign of madness or the sign of something you know, irrational and unjustified, which is not true at all if you actually look at the definition of what a conspiracy theorist is. But, of course, this is how they portray anybody that challenges the norm. Crazy people wearing tinfoil hats. You know, this is how it goes. And I'm afraid to say uh, our biggest institutions like the BBC are the most guilty of marginalising anybody that questions the status quo. And I mean, you know, there's a tale I tell in the book The Truth Agenda when I went on to the one show uh, with Marcus Allen of Nexus magazine uh, and Steve, uh, uh, a UFO investigator a few years ago, and it was just after the report on Princess Diana had come out, the official inquiry said there was no conspiracy, and it was just an accident. And we won't even go there tonight, all right, but that's what they said. Um, there was a discussion about why is it so many people still believe in conspiracy theories. So Kelvin McKenzie, of all people, interviews us, and we have a very nice afternoon in a hotel, and it's actually quite good. And we have some quite good discussions, and they film for about two and a half hours, Guess how much remained in the final program? Uh, two minutes. <laughs> 28 seconds. 
And uh, I think Steve, or no, John, and forgive me, it was John Wickham. John managed to say his name. Uh, Marcus, I think, just mentioned, I don't know, is there life on other planets? And I think I said the word Guy Fawkes, and that was it. And then cut back to the studio, where they then had four minutes of them debunking us. You see, so that's the thing, you're not given even the opportunity to make your case. And we thought we were, which is why we all bothered to show up. And this happens again and again and again. The BBC especially, since the David Kelly affair, where they got their knuckles wrapped, is afraid. It's so afraid of losing what is left of the uh, TV licence that it will not say boo to a goose. It will not challenge the authorities. And hence that's why it's very happy to broadcast absolute piffle like the conspiracy files because it is desperate to suck up to the authorities. But it is therefore utterly useless in terms of sharing anything with you in a fair or balanced way. And by the way, it's not just news programmes that do it. I mean, have you noticed how often the comedy shows are just as responsible for debunking anything fringe, anything alternative? They're the worst. Something like Mop the Week, they insult our intelligence by the way they talk about people that have concerns that are legitimate. But no, no, they just bother to be laughed at. So this is the problem we have. When you look at the statistics of what many people believe, you will often find that more people believe something than don't. And yet that is not reflected in the mainstream. I mean, for instance, in recent times, with the 9-11 commemorations, the polls that were taken around the world categorically show that over 50% of the world's population no longer believes the official story of 9-11. Isn't that extraordinary? That is a hell of a lot of people. Would you know that by watching the TV? No. No, you wouldn't know that. You would just uh, assume that uh, we were all completely balmy and we were about like 1% of the population. It's a lie. Well, the feeding is just a totally skewed vision of the way things really are and as such, by doing so, stifling debate. Now, we know, of course, that the media is controlled in itself. The media is in itself part of, if you want to call it, the global conspiracy. Why not? That'll do. And I mean, what we've seen with the whole Murdoch business is, of course, just scratching the surface. But it is important. And one of the reasons that it's important is that this has alerted very everyday folk to the fact that maybe they're being lied to. Now, this might not come as any big thing to you, but there's still people out there who still like to think that what they're told is the truth. Or at least even if they know in their hearts it isn't, they sort of pretend to go along with it as if it isn't. But what this has done, and I'm going to take questions at the end, sir, if I may, thank you. What this has done has made people suddenly aware of the appalling behaviour, never mind anything else, of the way the media's run. But most of all, that how much of our policy was being governed essentially by Rupert Murdoch. The amount of meetings that Murdoch people were having with every government that's been in power was ruled by proxy. There is no question about that. And, you know, marvellous scenes like this of Rebecca Brooks standing there with Tony Blair. I mean, you know, they'd love to write it off as just something that happened in the past, but they can't because until only recently it's just been replicated with a bunch who are there today. Uh, all of them have to keep these people happy, or had to, because they were afraid of them. But this is where you begin to realise where the real power lies. And make no mistake, this has made a lot of normal people, if you wish, question what's going on. It's not the first thing that's made them question. The MP's expenses thing, of course, made them suddenly feel, actually, maybe we're not told the truth. Maybe we can't trust these people. And, of course, that's making them much more open to what we might term more alternative ideas. And they are. And they're beginning to think their own thoughts, and they're not ashamed to think them anymore. And what I thought was so interesting, this person, this is Sean Hall. He was one of the first of the whistleblowers about what had happened at News International. And if anybody doesn't know the story on him, just as the Andy Coulson story broke, and he obviously had a lot to say about Andy Coulson, mysteriously found dead. Now, who knows? You know, I wasn't there when he died, but obviously a lot of people feel there's a lot of suspicious elements around his death. 
And of course, when people said, oh, come on, hang, what? hang on, the minute this all comes out, he dies, and you don't think that's strange, because the police, I think there's an open verdict, isn't there, that they don't really, haven't concluded how he died, which in itself is worrying. Uh, and anybody that pointed out that that was suspicious, how were they dismissed? Well, you're just a conspiracy theorist. That's how they shut up anybody, uh, and then of course by association, anybody that says that must be a wacko. So these are the problems that we have. Talking of the way the media deals with things, I mean, you know, bin Laden, does anybody here really believe, how many people believe that was Bin Laden they shot recently? <laughs> no? Uh, not, not. Right. Well, so here we are. Here's, here's Mr. Obama and uh, the rest of the bunch sitting there allegedly watching um, the death of Bin Laden live from Helmet Vision. Now, what the hell were they, what were they watching? We'll never know. Maybe they honestly thought they were watching it. We don't know. Who knew what? But the whole thing about the Bin Laden assassination is so insane. I mean, first of all, even Benazir Bhutto said that he had died for something like nine years previously, and then of course she died a couple of weeks after that, funnily enough. Um, a lot of people believe that Bin Laden died a long time ago, of course, but with Barack Obama doing very badly in the polls, they needed a boost, so they needed a boost. And it gave him a short boost, although I don't think it's lasted as much as he had hoped. It also enabled them to say, on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, as they did, well, you know, that's, that's a past chapter in history now. We've closed that chapter. But, you know, the evidence seems to say that whoever they shot in, in the underpants situation was not Ben Laden. And, I mean, the joke of it is so insane, isn't it? And then, and then they throw his body into the sea. You know, what a stupid thing to do. You know, even if it really was Ben Laden, the incompetence, it, well, it's too much, really, isn't it? Uh, they basically didn't want anybody to check the evidence that much, it's clear. So, but what I thought was amazing was that the media reported this, as the, like, this is how it is. You know, Ben Laden's gone, and it's like, despite all the many, many holes and absurdities in the story, they didn't question it. And that's when you realise, you hang on a minute, well, you know, who's this media really working for? Well, it, it's certainly not working for our truth, that's for sure. Um, you know, what we saw recently with the whole Gaddafi business tells you quite a lot. I mean, so they wouldn't show you Bin Laden's body, funnily enough, but they're very happy to have Gaddafi's bloody face being pistol whipped and whatever on the front of the newspapers, weren't they? Um, and the whole Gaddafi thing, I don't think you need me to say much to you about this. You know, what happened in Libya, I think, was, let's put it this way, not as we were told. Mm -hmm. It's basically some kind of Western imperialism yet again. Many people feel that was Gaddafi was, I think, probably not a good man, but some of the reforms he had brought in had helped the Libyan people in a way that now it's been completely reversed. It's back to the West being in control, okay? So there's lots of reasons really why they would have wanted to get rid of Gaddafi. That's not to say he was a nice man. But, you know, the fact that this is what happened to him, you know, the, the rebels that we've been supporting, you know, this is the first act really of their power, it's not encouraging. These are the people that we're dealing with, and then he was probably raped or whatever the hell they did to him, you know, just before he died. Um, he didn't deserve that, because I don't think anybody deserves that in death. Um, but the media, again, it's like, tang -tang -tang -tang. isn't this marvellous? And, uh, well, there's more to the story than that, of course. Some of you will know this, but for those that don't, you'll enjoy this. Uh, the BBC, one morning, just as Green Square was apparently, we were told, erupting with people celebrating the near downfall of Gaddafi, uh, the BBC broadcast live pictures from Green Square in Tripoli. So they broadcast this absolutely live one morning, and they said, here they are, the Gaddafi's fallen, and they're celebrating the, the fact that Gaddafi's gone. Well, a few people looked at this and said, that's a bit weird though, isn't it? Because that looks more like the Indian flag. And these people sort of look sort of Indian, don't they? <laughs> you want to have a look at the Indian flag? There's the Indian flag. You want to see the Libyan flag? There's the Libyan flag. <laughs> That's the Indian flag. I mean, just the black stripe in itself tells you everything. Um, and indeed, it transpired that this is footage of an Indian demonstration from, I think, two or three years ago. Now, bear in mind, this was broadcast as live pictures. Live pictures, okay. Now, that means that, obviously, they're not live pictures. This is a fraud. It's propaganda. It's war propaganda. 
They wanted the world to think that your daddy was falling before he really was. Okay. Now some would say, well, maybe that's justified. It's still a lie. Okay. There's still lies through their teeth. But the thing is that somebody would have had to have gone down to the archives physically and said, I need this piece of footage, sign it out, as well as bureaucracy at the BBC, it would have had to come all the way back through the system, and somebody had to run that in the machine, and then say, this is live. This is fraud. That's not an accident. There's no accident here. <laughs> so, when the BBC tells us anything, are we ever going to believe them? Probably not. And, you know, the conspiracy files made that very clear. But what is astonishing is how people do not realise they are being lied to now, here, today, by the wonderful BBC, that around the rest of the world they all think is marvellous, but it's now a propaganda tool and not much else, I am afraid to say. So there's a good example of how we've been manipulated. One last word on the Gaddafi thing. I don't know if you heard this, but I'll stay in the footage because you'll throw up in your seat. You don't need to see it. <laughs> Hillary Clinton, bless her. Um, Not. Um, so she's on live TV on uh, CBS News in America, and word comes through while she's sitting there that Gaddafi has died. Okay. And her response, so you can see there, was to crack a joke. And she cracked this joke. She said, Well, she said, We came, we saw, he died. <laughs> I'm about that. Okay, you don't have to like your enemy, but, but to crack a silly joke tells you something about the mentality of the people we're dealing with here. If there's something wrong, because, right, I think you can have an issue with somebody and know you've got to deal with that person or with whatever, however awful they are, there's got to be some level of human compassion. Because if there isn't, you are as bad as they are. If you attack tyranny with tyranny, you're just the same. There's got to be some element of compassion in all of the things that we're concerned about. And this show, they have nothing. These people are not really human. And some people, of course, believe they really are human. That's another story. <laughs> so, you know, the whole thing with the Arab uprisings is one of what do you believe? And this is a tricky one. I mean, here's the Egypt uh, uprising, original one. Now it seems to be in part two. Is it... A natural outpouring of people really wanting freedom. Is it the result of Western manipulation? Well, I would argue probably it's somewhere between the two. Okay. Because the people, no doubt, were oppressed. And they're not very happy living under a dictatorship that was basically in the pay of the West. Okay. So they've got every legitimate reason to take to the streets. But it does seem here and in some of the other countries where it's gone on that, that what we're dealing with also is being nudged from elsewhere. I think it's hard to come to any other conclusion. And then the Libya situation, of course, was a very obvious example of that. It is Western imperialism by proxy. So this is the problem, and yet, you know, the media's full of these images, you know, this is the global agenda, they're telling you, look, all these wonderful people fighting for their freedom, we must support them, and yet, then it all goes a bit weird, and like with Libya, and then suddenly you're told to support the rebels, who don't really seem like a very nice bunch of people, and nobody knows really what they stand for anyway. So there's a kind of confusion, but you're certainly not going to get the truth from a TV company that broadcasts false footage. And by the way, it's not the first time that BBC had done that. Uh, you will remember after 9-11, they broadcast the, the, the Muslims celebrating in the streets. That was a bit of footage that was about seven years old. Okay, so they did it again to manipulate it. Whatever your views on it, they were trying to manipulate a reaction. So we need to be very, very careful of this. And, I mean, the whole thing about the way we try to get influence in the Middle East, of course, is, is an old chestnut. The weapons of mass destruction thing was, of course, a prime example of that. Uh, uh, needing to get control, needing to go in there. The whole David Kelly affair, you don't need me to really remind you very much about that. But what I want to say something about it very briefly here, because rather like right, what we were saying earlier on about the Murdoch things, made suddenly people really begin to realise, hang on, maybe there is something wrong at the core here. You know, the Kelly affair has done that too. You won't find many people anywhere on a bus in the London Palladium, you won't find many who will think that he did commit suicide. They might say it quietly, but most people will say, oh yeah, of course they knocked him off. 
Same with Princess Diana. It doesn't matter what the findings are. Most people, somewhere in their gut, think she was murdered. And that's certainly the case with Kelly. So that's when you begin to realise, because for anybody that doesn't know, the wound shouldn't have killed him, the drug shouldn't have killed him, his body was presumably moved from where it was originally found and then seemingly dragged to look better for the police pictures. Yet when Norman Baker MP, when an MP publishes a book called The Strange Death of Dr David Kelly, you know you're dealing with something where the evidence is, shall we say, not clear cut. And when an MP starts saying, well, it's very likely he was murdered, you know you're into interesting business. The fact that Lord Hutton had to put a block on the medical records of this case for 70 years tells you everything, doesn't it? Because if they really wanted to prove that this man had committed suicide, well, they'd just release the documents and be done. But, but, but this is why, and then they wonder why the people go into conspiracy theory. Well, I wonder why. And that's the kind of reason why. But again, in the collective psyche, most, there's a few that don't, but most people believe in their gut that this was something that had to happen. Get him out of the way because he was saying there were no weapons of mass destruction because they needed these wars for the whole global mandate. So let's just briefly say a little bit about, you know, what you all really know about the whole New World Order thing, so we can then move on. But I think we need to just briefly restate it. You know, there is a view held by many people, though you might not necessarily know it from what we see on the telly, that there is you know, an agenda, there is a global agenda. We are being manipulated, that there is some kind of ruling elite. Okay, and how definite you think it is, and what you think it stands for, you can all have different arguments. Who are the Illuminati? Is it the Illuminati? Is it somebody else? Is it Mossad? Is it the Jesuits? Well, I, I don't know. I, we're not going to settle that tonight. It doesn't actually matter. It's very clear that world events are manipulated by somebody, and it ain't for our benefit generally. Okay, and of course, this is where you get into the whole thing of the one world government or the new world order, and. David Icke, of course, you know, put forward the famous equation, problem, reaction, solution. Let's just remind ourselves of how it works. So we must always be kept in fear, of course. Now, fear of terrorism has been a big one. Okay, and you all know about that. But there are others. Now, you've got legitimate concerns about the whole immigration thing, and rightly so. But look how we are still manipulated by fear. It's misused. It's not being dealt with. It's just creating fear. And the money aspect of it is massive fear. What's going on at the moment? The fear of poverty, the whole austerity measures. We're going along with it because we're afraid that it might be worse if we don't go along with what they're telling us to do. Okay? And we need to be very careful here because often there are legitimate concerns. You don't want to be blown up by terrorists, right? You don't want mass immigration completely overbalancing the country, but you don't want to give in to the fear that they are also trying to put on you that somebody else is always to blame, be it terrorists, be it the bankers. Because by doing that, we stop taking responsibility for sorting these things out, and we disempower ourselves. And I believe that's actually part of what they would love. They want to think that we have no power here. And of course, one of the other big ones is the one we mentioned earlier on, global warming. Even if you believe that global warming is real, it's been utterly mishandled, it's been utterly misconceived in the way they've tried to get us to deal with it by fear. You do not solve anything with fear. You do not solve anything unless you have some understanding and compassion and serious discussion where everybody is allowed to air their views and be heard, because then the truth will emerge. Because, of course, while we're all so utterly confused with all that, what we're doing is then collectively seeking the distraction. So we put on the TV. So we fill our heads with junk, we fill our bodies with junk and chemicals, and you know, we're tempted with lovely things and materialism and shopping. And the media feeds us these most ridiculous stories, like, you know, Freddy Star ate my hamstrings, but a, but a minor one. Go to WH Smith tomorrow and look at the magazine shelves. Look, really look at the utter mind drop we are being fed. The mind control, the brainwashing, the programming. And it is actually quite stunningly shocking to see how our minds are powers, if you like, of 
would ever have thought are being just rotted away day by day by this distraction. There are a lot of people out there that don't even realise that the kind of issues that we're discussing tonight are even going on because they're too busy worrying about what hairstyle Jordan's got that week. And this is the problem. And as you know, while that's going on, what's coming in underneath, as David Icke has so famously pointed out, is the control. So in this country we have more surveillance cameras than any other country in the world. The heavier policing comes in when we ask for it, like we have after the riots. We now have scanners that show your wobbly bits at airports because we're so shit scared of being blown up. And that's a legitimate fear, but it's abused to the point where it goes beyond the call of duty, as has the whole health and safety thing. Okay. And you know about this kind of stuff, and you know the kind of stuff that Brian Garish has been talking about for a long time. That all of this stuff is, of course, just an overture to the ultimate solutions, and before you know it, as David Icke's pointed out, we're into the world of microchipping. Because we'll beg for it, because we're afraid. And that is, of course, exactly what's going on at the moment. Now, most of you know this, so we won't go into all of this, but this is the equation that you can very now clearly see going on. I don't think you can just say, well, this is just a wild theory, because you've only got to switch on the news to see this is happening virtually in front of your eyes. This equation is working out now. And you will know where real power lies, okay? And the, the old chestnuts, the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, Tavistock Institute, Club of Rome, the Council on Foreign Relations, and so on and so on and so on. Yes, there are big decisions being made in these places that have nothing to do with the democratic process. We have no say. And of course, George Osborne famously goes along to the Bilderberg Group, amongst many other people, and then makes decisions that have nothing to do with our parliament. What's he doing doing that? We're funding this. We're supporting these organisations, think tanks and quangos, that really are making big, big decisions, but we have no say. And of course, there are darker and dodgier organisations above or beneath these, with occult the links and all the rest of it. And we know this, and I don't need to go into that today. But I want to mention a couple of other things. Many of you will be familiar with this piece of uh, footage, but some of you may not be, and you really, really need to hear this if you've not seen this before. Because money is the other big control tool. And it's all very well to talk about the evil bankers, but what does that mean? And is it evil, or is this just a system we've got ourselves blocked into? The BBC, bless their hearts, broadcast this, and they didn't really mean to, and I'm sure they wouldn't have done it if they could have avoided it. It went out live on the BBC News channel. This man is a trader. He trades and sucks and bonds, and to their surprise and shock, he told the truth. So they were asking, what about the Eurozone? You know, if the Euro collapses, is that the end of the world? So this is what he was on to talk about. And instead of saying, yes, my God, it is the end of the world, or no, you know, this is what we'll do. In fact, he said, oh, I don't really care. I'm making money, so what? <laughs> so listen to this, right, it's a bit quiet, I apologise, you have to listen carefully, but just listen to this, and it's about three minutes long, but listen to it all, because this will send a tingle through your spine that he's talking the entire truth about the whole way the world of money, which rules our lives, works. So have a listen to this. Markets are ruled right now by fear. Uh, investors and the big money, the smart money. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the big funds, the hedge funds, the institutions. They don't buy this rescue plan. Uh, they, they basically, um, they know the market is toast. They know the stock market is finished. The euro, as far as they're concerned, they don't really care. They're moving their money away to safer uh, assets, uh, like treasury bonds, 30-year uh, bonds, and the US dollar. Uh, so it's not gonna work. We, we keep hearing that whatever they, the politicians are suggesting, and admittedly it's all been rather woolly so far, isn't right. Can you pin down exactly what would keep investors happy, make them feel more confident? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, personally, uh, it doesn't matter. But that's, see, I'm a trader. Uh, I don't really care about that kind of stuff. I go with what the, I, if I've seen an opportunity to make money, I go with that. Uh, so for most traders, it's not about is that we don't really care that much how they're going to fix the how they're going to fix the economy, how they're going to fix the uh, the whole situation. Our job is to make money from it. And personally, I've been dreaming of this one for three years. Uh, I I have a confession, which is uh, I go to bed every night. I dream of another recession. 
I dream of another moment like this. Why? Because uh, people don't seem to uh, maybe remember, but uh, the 30s depression, the depression in the 30s, wasn't just about the market crash. There were some people who were prepared to make money from that crash. And I think anybody can do that. It, it isn't just for some people in the elite. Anybody can actually make money. It's an opportunity. Uh, when the market crashes, uh, when the euro and the big stock markets crash, if you know what to do, um, if, if you have the right plan to set up, uh, you, can, you can make a lot of money from this. Uh, for example, hedging strategies is one. Um, then investing in bonds, treasury bonds, that sort of stuff. If you could see the people around me, jaws have collectively dropped at what you just said. I mean, we, we appreciate your candor, however, it doesn't help the rest of us, does it, or the rest of the Euro though? I would say this, listen, I would say this to everybody who's watching this, this economic crisis is like a cancer. If you just wait and wait thinking this is going to go away, just like a cancer, it's going to grow and it's going to be too late. What I would say to everybody is, get prepared. Uh, this is not a time right now to uh, wishful thinking the government is going to sort things out. The governments don't rule the world. Goldman Sachs rules the world. <laughs> Goldman Sachs does not care about this rescue package, neither does the big funds. So actually, what I would, I, I would actually tell people, I want to help people, uh, people can make money from this, it isn't just traders. What they need to do is learn about how to, how to make money from a, a downward market. Uh, the first thing people should do is protect their assets, protect what they have. Because in less than 12 months, uh, my prediction is that savings of mil millions of people is going to vanish. Uh, and this is just the beginning. Well, how's that for a period interview, eh? Now, you might argue this guy is the problem, but he's also just telling the blatant truth, I think, of how it is. You've got to admire that, at least. And he, interesting, he makes a point saying it's not just for the elite. In other words, you can all do it. But whether that's really the most moral solution is, of course, another matter. But this is the way their minds work. So, you know, this is why people are sitting outside St. Paul's Cathedral today in their tents or whatever, because we all know at the core there's something really wrong in what has happened. But there is the reality. There's no point denying that reality. You're face to face here with the actuality of how these people's minds work. And we've got to find a way of dealing with that on a level that may make some sense. I don't know how. I don't know how we overturn this situation. But the fact is Goldman Sachs does rule the world. And Rockefellers and Rothschilds and all the rest of it, you know the story. Um, how we turn that around, I don't know. But there are certainly some starting things we can begin to do. And before we get to discussing a few solutions, I do just want to make one more point about something recently. There is another big issue in our lives that actually even the alternative world doesn't talk about enough, and that is the arms trade. The arms trade is one of the most insidious, wicked things that utterly supports the economy. Without it, everything would have collapsed years ago. Our economy only works because people are having their arms and legs blown off and depleted uranium is causing havoc and appalling things throughout the world. It's supporting this world that we live in today. And you think it was interesting when Liam Fox uh, was discovered that this gentleman here strange Adam Werity was following him around everywhere. Suddenly people went, oh yeah, who is this guy? And it turns out, of course, that he's basically a lobbyist for arms dealers. So here they are, you know, with the whole Sri Lankan uh, government and all the rest of it. There are so many questionable, dodgy wars going on around the world, and you can bet your life somewhere the West is involved. Albeit just through the arms trade. And what is so funny is, we may purport to support one side, but you'll often find we're selling them to both sides. Because all the time, we're making money from war, we need wars, wars won't stop. They're not going to stop because they need the war to maintain the lifestyles we are living. And that's the dilemma. Because I personally think that this kind of world stinks on every level. But I also recognise that the day you stop it, we've got to find a new way to set up the world. And we've got to find a new way so that the guy you just heard a minute ago isn't the kind of mindless in command of it. There are no straightforward solutions. And yet, if we all start to take a bit of responsibility, real responsibility, maybe that is the beginning of an answer. But I do think this needs to be talked about more than it is. And one thing I'll say for the Quakers, the Quakers are very good about campaigning against the arms trade. And they've got some very good information. Check it out sometime, because you'll be shocked 
you'll be shocked at just how basically immoral these people are. A bit like the banker, he doesn't care what happens as long as he's getting the money. They don't care who dies or is maimed or appallingly injured as long as they're getting the money. But unfortunately, this supports the world that we live in. Now, I want to change tack briefly. All of that is the problem. Okay? All of that is where we've got, and there's so much more we could say, of course, but you get the idea. But now I want to say something about these times we're living in, because there is so much misinformation going around about the whole 2012 phenomenon. We need to just briefly dis discuss this. Now, over the years, I've been very involved with investigating this through my own works and working with people like Jeff Stray. Uh, and I edited Jeff Stray's book, Beyond 2012. We've got a couple of copies on the table if you want to look later on. It is, I believe, a categorical fact that there is a cycle of time recorded around the world that is 5,125 years, that is probably based on astronomical cycles, and that these ancient cultures believed it mattered. And that when the cycle ended and began again, there would be some kind of change, upheaval, transformation. And most of you will have heard now of the 2012 prophecies, but if you haven't, go away and find out. And I'm just going to give you a basic lowdown on what it's all about. Because here we are, on the eve of 2012, that auspicious year that many people in the alternative world have been talking about for so long. And many are hoping that it's going to overturn many of the things that we've just been talking about. But there's no such thing as a free lunch, of course. Okay? We're going to have to do the work. You don't suddenly just get enlightenment out of nowhere. And if you do, you will really want to question where it's come from. Okay? Let's look at this. What's this about? 21st of December 2012, at 11.11 11 a.m., precisely, universal time, is the end of the old cycle and the beginning of the new. Isn't it weird that it's at 11.11? 11? What's the mystics have said? 11.11 11 are very important numbers. And it's just complete chance that that's the exact moment of the solstice. Isn't that weird? The beginning of 2012. Oh, sorry, the end of 2012. So... Lots of people are expecting great things. Now, I will say immediately, I do not believe that even if there is anything to the prophecies, that it's all going to happen on one day. I think that's being very, very basic about it. I believe it will be a much more gradual process. So make sure you get some food and drink in for the 22nd of December, all right? Because if you're waiting to be, you know, whatever, taken up on board a spaceship or whatever, it, it might take a little bit longer. But where does all this come from? What's it about? Well... What are the actual prophecies? Well, there aren't that many Mayan prophecies, and yet the Mayan prophecies are the ones you always hear about. In fact, there is only one uh, stone carving from the high culture of the Maya, and it's this one, Monument 6 at Tortuguero in Mexico. And it's describing what would happen at the end of the cycle. So in other words, at the end of next year, what would happen? And it describes the return of the nine support gods. And very annoyingly, it's just getting to tell you what they're going to do when it's broken off. And we can't read the last bit of it. So we don't know what they're going to do. So we have to rely on later writings of what they call the Chalam Balam, or the Jaguar priests, who wrote down a lot of stuff that had just been word of mouth, and they described the usual fire, flood, war, famine, and all the rest of it that you normally get in these devastating prophecies. But again, a talk of the Golden Age. By the way, in the Chilam Balam writings, there's a fantastic line about, you will know when it is this time, because it will be a time when no one believes in their governments. <laughs> so that seems very apt, doesn't it? So there's the Maya stuff, and uh, you will hear everything about Maya prophecies, but you probably won't hear very much about the others, and there are others for them all around the world. So I'll just show you a few of the others. When people say Maya, they often show you this which isn't Maya. They'll often show you the Aztec sunstone. The Aztecs came after the Maya, and were in a slightly different location to the Maya. But nonetheless, this famous dial, and Jeff Stray believes it would originally have been a moving dial that recorded what happened at the transition of each age, uh, it nonetheless still contains uh, direct links to uh, the Maya calendar, which in itself was based on the previous Olmec civilization calendar. So this information, this knowledge that something happens on this cycle goes back a long, long way. The Aztecs were more doomy. They believed this current era, or sun, as they called it, this current sun, was the very last one. 
So if you were an Aztec, you believe that we've only got a year left. I like to think that they're wrong. Um, down a little bit further in Peru, uh, the Incas had their own take on this. Now, what they were waiting for was what they called the uh, Pachacuti, which translates as the turning over of the world. Now, that's interesting because there's been all sorts of predictions about axis tilts and magnetic field reversals and all of this. Um, and, I mean, one of the interesting things also is that you've got almost identical prophecies and turning over the world up in the North Americas, the Hopi especially. Uh, but the Hopi Native Americans, they were more specific about what they were waiting for to know that we'd be in these times. And uh, one of the things that they were waiting for was the Blue Star Kachina. And the Blue Star Kachina was uh, some kind of you know, heavenly body. Uh, they believed that when this arrived, it would herald what they called the emergence and the time of the great purification. Well, some people believe Blue Star Kachina has already been and gone. Because in 2007, we had Comet Holmes. That was a very blue comet. And by the time it got near the sun, and so the gases then expanded out, so it's what they call coma, grew to its largest size. It was bigger than our sun. And some are saying, well, yeah, you could see that as the fulfillment of the prophecy of a blue star. Which means that we are now in a time of huge change. You could say that all of that's down in the Americas, maybe word just spread over the borders, but you can go right round the other side of the planet to the Maori, for instance. Uh, they have, again, similar prophecies. The same time cycle is embedded in their culture. One of the interpretations that we had for many years of one of their writings was this. So it reads, Kahinga Tiari, and everybody thought that meant the curtain will fall. This is describing what will happen at the end of the cycle. But actually, in more recent times, they've realized that's not a very good translation. And most likely, that is what it should mean. The veil will dissolve. Now, that has quite a different connotation here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I realize we're getting here into sort of like almost new age stuff, and you're probably thinking, how does this tie in with anything we've talked about? <coughs> well, I'll show you in a minute how it might tie in. Okay? So it's important to know this. In another continent, the Zulus, Zulu shamans, have the same beliefs, essentially, the same cycles. Uh, what some of them are waiting for is the return of Mushushu Nono. What a great name, Mushushu Nono which is a kind of a planetary body, which sounds very like you know, the Sumerian legend of Nibiru. Of course, some people believe Nibiru is on its way in, but whatever, that there is a body that comes in on a wide elliptical orbit, and when it comes back in, it creates havoc, gravitational effects, changes the wind and the weather, and all sorts of things. If it's Nibiru, of course, the Sumerians believe the gods lived on Nibiru. And they believe, probably, that the gods are still there today, which means the gods might return and they might like us back. Because some of the Sumerian legends say that the gods basically genetically engineered us to be what we are as a slave race. So if they do arrive back, you better worry. Okay, we could go on. I won't. There are religious prophecies about it. Some say the book of Revelation is all about 2012. Some say the whole tale of Kali Yuga and the Hindu civilizations about, you know, the end of days, the beginning of the new era. There are crop circles. I don't care what you think about crop circles. In my view, they are not all man-made. But I don't care what you think, because what is so interesting is what's triggered by them. And so many of them have directly referred to 2012. Here is a phenomenal formation from three years ago showing the solar system as it will be on 21st of December 2012. And there's been many, many others. Even if you think they're all man-made, something is coming through the collective. In my personal view, they are not. But that's for another time. Uh, and people who claim they've met alien extraterrestrial beings, these beings often say to them, your world is about to change. And everything you know is going to completely change and you are going to be in a better state of consciousness at the other end of it, but it might be quite unsettling while you're going through it. <coughs> So there are many, many reasons to believe that there was some meaning in this cycle of time that many cultures knew about. Now, Dr. Paul Violet says that these pulses coming out from the center of the galaxy would have its most profound effect on that thing which is closest to us, 
which is uh, the sun, well, closest in terms of a star. Okay. So for many people, what 2012 is about is about the solar cycles, the wider solar cycles. You have an 11 year cycle, but you have wider cycles. And many people believe these are controlled by these pulses coming out from the middle of the galaxy. Now, that is a theory, but what's currently going on with the sun fits the theory very well. And indeed, over the last 15, 20 years, we've had the, the most solar activity or the largest solar activity that we've known in many, many years. Uh, we've seen, for instance, the biggest coronal mass ejections, the biggest flares. For instance, we had a flare in 2003 that was an X45 on a scale that previously only went up to X20. People didn't think it could go more than that. They had to extend the scale. And they said that if that had been pointed towards Earth, we could have been in trouble. And this is an interesting thing, because NASA is now giving out very, very overt warnings that if the sun produces a huge solar flare and it is pointed in our direction, our electrical grids are going to be in a lot of trouble. Now, this takes us into interesting territory. NASA held a meeting two years ago in 2009 to discuss the Solar Shield project and they called in defence secretaries and scientists from many, many different governments around the world, including Liam Fox. He went and they sat them down and they said, you need to take the sun seriously because we are really concerned about what the sun is about to do. Because, as I said, we, we already know solar activity can knock out satellites. Solar activity it is said, knocked out the Canadian power grids back in 2003. And yet the sun is building up. We're getting bigger flares, more sunspots, bigger sunspots than we've seen for years right now. And they're concerned. Because the problem is that, of course, it would disrupt all life on Earth. I'm going to play you something here. This is real. It's not a hoax. This is genuine. This was broadcast, or you can find it even now, on the NASA website. This is Charles F. Bolden, who is the head administrator at NASA. And it's couched in quite gentle terms, but it's basically a warning aimed at NASA staff, telling them to be ready for an emergency. Unspecified, but a lot of people are putting two and two together with what he's saying, with what NASA are warning about the devastating effects of the sun on our power grids. Because, of course, before the power grids went down, they're saying it could burn out so many transformers, it could take months, even years, to get them all working. And, of course, we're going to be back to a medieval feudal system if we're not careful. And I'll show you an example of how that might come about in a moment. But listen to what Charles Bolden has to say. <coughs> listen to this. It gave me a few minutes just to talk to all of, uh, all of you in our NASA family about emergency preparedness. Um, NASA recently participated in a FEMA exercise called Eagle Horizon that was a part of a continuity of operations and government exercise that we do annually. And I became aware of some things that concern me about our family preparedness, and I wanted to talk to you very briefly. You know, we in NASA, we're an incredibly unique organization. We're the only agency in the federal government that's responsible for the safety and well-being of people not only here on Earth, but uh, off this planet. So um, my experience in the astronaut office, uh, my experience as an active duty Marine, uh, always talk about the importance of family preparedness and to make sure that we had a viable family support program. And I have concerns that ours right now is not uh, as good as it ought to be. So what I'm asking all of you in the NASA family, whether you're out on the West Coast, here on the East Coast, along the Gulf Coast, uh, up on the, the, you know, the Great Lakes, Think about the, the natural disasters that could occur in your area. Think about attacks that could come like 9-11 from outside forces. And talk to your family about your work and what they need to do to prepare for the unforeseen. Uh, develop a family preparedness plan in your house. Uh, have an emergency supply kit available. Most people who live along the, the, the Gulf Coast always have an emergency kit for hurricanes. I, I'm not sure whether people out on the West Coast think about uh, earthquakes and the like, but have an emergency supply kit at your home. Think about a family communications plan. Where are we going to meet if an emergency occurs and we're all over the, all over town? Uh, what are we going to do? Are we going to call each other on the cell phone? Just think about those things. If you have pets, think about a pet preparedness plan. How are you going to make sure that they're taken care of when you're spread all over the place? 
Uh, and then if you have family members who have special needs, special needs preparedness. The most important asset uh, for us to successfully complete our mission is that our people, our families mainly, are taken care of so that we can come to work and feel good that if an, an emergency arises, our families are going to be taken care of. So I would ask you again, sit with your families, think about what you would do in an emergency situation. I hope that you'll embrace and support the Family Preparedness Program as we all get better prepared to deal with these emergencies. Know your stuff. You know, know what it is that you're going to do. Know what it is that you want your family to do if an emergency arises. But most of all, be prepared. What if that doesn't disturb you? It disturbs me. I don't believe it. Well, that's another story. Whether it's misinformation, of course, or whether it's genuine. But I personally believe, if you look at the science of what the sun's doing at the moment, that I think they are seriously concerned. It's my personal belief, okay? And I think we do need to be concerned because, let's take you back to last year. Now, I don't know how much snow you had here. In our neck of the woods, okay, we had a night of snow. And here we are. Here's, here's the village scene, Forest Row, near East Grinstead. Here you go. And what was very interesting was after just one day of snow, right, civilization ground to a halt. There was no petrol. No lorries could get in, so the petrol all went almost instantly, and so people were getting worried because they couldn't use their cars. If you went into the shop, there was no food. People were going crazy. Oh my God! Maybe there'll be no food tomorrow, so we've got to buy everything. And within a day, every shelf was empty. I mean, if you could live on Quality Street, you'd be all right, but that would be about it, all right? That's just one day of snow. By the next day, a Land Rover was going around the village, sending food off the back of the Land Rover. It was like Mad Max. It was like some post-apocalypse because of two days of snow. Now, you imagine if the power turns <coughs> off. One day, two days, three days, a week later, still no power. Imagine that then there's no food coming. There's no food chain. What's going to happen? And the first thing that would happen in about a week would be you'd have the riots starting all over again and people saying, oh my God, I'm just going to take what I need. And this is why some people do have covers stocked full of food and water. And it might not be solarless, it could be all number of things. It could be the big financial crash. It could be some engineered thing that we all think we should be afraid of. Who knows what it will be? But there is a strong feeling at the moment that we are being built up, rightly or wrongly, for something, and when you see the way people behave in quite basic circumstances, you really do have to wonder what would happen if something were to occur on a very big scale. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to be with the rioters down at Tesco kicking down the door, and it would turn very, very nasty very quickly. They always say, don't they, we're only two meals from revolution. Well, I think we're getting close to that. But there's another side to this. There's another side to this. So, could it be that authorities, they might not know what's going to happen, but they have a deep fear of this. But they've got a fear of something else. One of the prophecies that recurs throughout all the different cultures about this time cycle that many people think has got to do with the sun, and the wider things that change that, is that mankind will be left in a higher state of consciousness at the other end of it. Okay? And some are saying that while you might be getting, you know, God knows what going on, hurricanes, wild weather, responding to the solar flares plus no electrics, you might not care because you'll be undergoing an incredible hallucinogenic experience. <laughs> People like Rick Stressman or Dr. Michael Persinger have been experimenting for years with exposing the brain to electromagnetic pulse waves, which is what we would get big time from the wrong kind of solar flare or the right kind of solar flare, depending on which way you look at it. And it changes our entire state of being. We start to produce, for instance, natural dimethyltryptamine, DMT, which is what some people take ayahuasca for. And it changes your state of consciousness. Some are saying this might be the very thing that triggers mankind's next stage of evolution. Because in the New Age world, many people have been talking for years about ascension. It's not dissimilar to the whole rapture business in the evangelical world. But ascension is similar in as much as they think something will happen that will rise us up to some higher state of being. Now, who knows what would happen after that? 
But the point that I want to make to start to draw these threads together is this. You know that the kind of people running the world have deep occult beliefs. You know about things like the Bohemian Club and very big world leaders dress up in funny robes and worship giant stone owls and all of that. So do you think the kinds of people that would do that would not be aware of all the ancient prophecies? I think they'd be more aware than we will. And even if they don't know whether there's anything to it or not, they will not want to take a chance. They will not want to take a chance, number one, of losing control, or this control they've built up over the years. But maybe the other reason for that control is that they don't want this happening. The pouring is full of chemicals, don't forget. Denying us medicine, natural medicine, and ways of being that might actually make us empowered. So everything they're doing seems to want to disempower us, physically and mentally, and debilitate us. Because the last thing they want is a planet full of people that suddenly don't need them. And if they had any sense that that was going to happen, what are they going to do? They're going to put measures in to control us. This is a theory. Many people are going with this. That actually one of the things they're really scared of is that there might be a seed of truth to the prophecies. And if there is, they're trying to make absolutely sure that they will stay on top. And that we don't suddenly get out of line and get above ourselves because we think we're in the new enlightenment times. And of course, that may be particularly big next year. 2012, of course, is a whole year, not just 21st of uh, December 2012. Next year, you know that the eyes of everybody on the planet who's got a telly anyway will at some point be looking here. And what's going on here in England in particular, London especially. And you know that when Beijing had the Olympics, everybody was looking at China, everybody was looking at what was going on in China. Everything that was happening there socially or whatever was constellated and broadcast around the world. And we were all discussing what's going on in China. It will be what's going on in Britain. Who are, the, who are these British? What's going on? They don't have a very good expectation. They've seen all the rioting and everything. I mean, you will have heard the measures they are bringing in, the security measures. Then they're, they're now going to surround the stadium with surface-to-air missiles. U.S. surface-to-air missile. Has there ever been an Olympic stadium that's had surface-to-air missiles? Well, I don't know. It, it's as if they're really, really expecting trouble, isn't it? And there's something else. There's something in the symbolism of the games, right? The, and maybe we need to look at it a little bit more closely because you would imagine we would want to project an image of Britain that was thrusting and powerful and great. But the messages we're giving out are a bit weird. Now, number one, it's the shittiest logo of all time, which spells Zion, as we all know. I mean, that's fairly obvious because the dot in the middle. Whether that's a joke or serious, I'll leave you to make your own minds up. But there's more to it than that. Okay? Number one. Have you seen the Olympic mascots? If you haven't, meet Wenlock and Mandeville. Now, first of all, do you know what they're meant to be? No? Ah, you see, you don't know, which says a lot, doesn't it? I'll tell you what they are. Here's the official explanation. This is what they are. Wenlock and Mandeville are two drops of molten steel spilt in the making of the last steel girder used in the Olympic Stadium. Well, now it's obvious, isn't it? <laughs> No, it's not obvious. It's bizarre. Anthropologists immediately criticise these mascots, and they say they've got no faces. Children cannot relate to these. You need a face. They've done studies. Children need faces to relate to. Okay, Brian Garish would have something to say about this. These you can't relate to. They're alienating. They're quite scary. And is it just me, and it can't be, that's noticed they look a little bit suspiciously like that? The all-seeing eye, the home oh, on the pyramid, the Illuminati. Don't you think it's just kind of interesting that there's a sort of a faintly try? You know, is that a joke, or is it the meaningful occult symbol? So now there's kids going to bed clutching the Illuminati symbol when they go to bed. Mummy. Interesting, isn't it? But there's more. Have you seen the tower they're building next to the stadium? Here it is. So here we are. We could show Britain 
you know, you know, thrusting like the skylon in the Festival of Britain. But no, we get this pile of twisted metal. And it's really interesting to hear what the architect had to say about this. So he's well known an architect. When asked what's this about, here's what he said. And he said, I wanted the sensation of instability. Not instability, but instability. Think about that. This is the message we're giving to the world. Unstable Britain. Boy, they already think we're unstable because of everything that's been going on here recently. And isn't it interesting that the architect, so you've got alienating mascots, a logo which has many weird messages to it, and a tower that is one of the worst offences against architecture in the eyes of many. This is what we're projecting out to the world. And some people think that we should be worried. To get esoteric briefly, even if there was no such thing as an ancient prophecy about the next two years, if you look at astrology, astrology is something else that is unfairly debunked. Look at the statistics to support the reality of it. Not crappy sun <coughs> horoscopes, serious psychological astrology. If you want to know more, talk to my partner Helen over there. Charts can be drawn up for countries as well as people. Next year, Britain, well, I won't go into the ins and outs of it. Our sun is up on the mid-heaven. We are in the world. We were always meant to be. But there's a square of Uranus and Pluto. And any astrologer will tell you that means trouble. Because Uranus is about wanting to break out, wanting to rebel, wanting freedom of spirit. Pluto is about control, stamping it down. It was always written that here in Britain, it was always going to be constellated in these next two years of rebellion against control, against oppression. Okay? Even if you didn't believe in the other prophecies. So everything we've seen recently, of course, is a lot of people will want to use this kind of stuff next year to either make their own point or to disrupt or it will just naturally happen anyway. On the astrological chart for next summer, funnily enough, one of the, the most troublesome times is the 4th of June. That's the weekend of the Diamond Jubilee, where there will be lots of celebrations across the country. The last time we had similar astrological aspects to that was the day of 7-7, oh. funnily enough. And of course a lot of people are very worried that the Olympics will be the scene for some false flag terror attack, fake alien invasion, call it what you will, it's something big and nasty. But others are saying, well, maybe something could happen on the Diamond Jubilee that would then justify even more shutdowns of freedom. Because already, you're not going to get near London next year. You know, it, when the Olympics are on, Britain is going to be in security shutdown. We've got American missiles in London guarding us, our safety. It's going to be the most oppressive time we've seen in a long, long time. And those people that feel that they're nothing to do with it, nothing to do with all that money that's been spent on the Olympics, they're not going to sit still for it. I would be very surprised if we get to the end of the next year without major social unrest. The problem is, of course, you could say, well, that's fully justified, given the things that they've got to be unrestful about. The problem comes that, is that exactly what they want us to do? As we saw with the riots earlier on, many people think we were deliberately stirred to riot, allowed for it, because then they bring in all the draconian controls that they ever wanted. And the Olympics were already being used to justify massive abuses of terror laws, stop and search, you know, the whole thing. And of course, if there is big unrest, maybe we need to think very, very carefully about how we respond. Okay? And if we respond with violence, we'll be met with violence. I think we have got to think very carefully about what we stand for and what we're trying to put across here and not fall into the traps that I believe are being set for us. Part of the problem is what we're lacking at the moment, there are any people out there who can lead some kind of positive revolution, is Prometheus in Greek myth. Prometheus stole fire okay, from the god's blacksmith and he gave it to mankind so that mankind became enlightened and could use the fire to develop and progress. And Zeus punished him for this because they didn't want mankind having that power. And he wound up getting chained up on a rock where his liver was pecked out every day by an eagle and it regrew. He eventually got released. But Prometheus makes the point that sometimes you need to do something because it's right to do it. But it doesn't mean you'll necessarily get any thanks for it. But maybe we have to stop looking for appreciation or thanks and decide what is right. 
How do we do what is right? Where are the Promethean figures? Is the world a celebrity? Probably not. I don't see anybody coming up. You know, celebrity is part of the problem. It, it, it's a, a massive distraction. And, you know, bless Jordan, but this is not the way forward. What's happened to the religious figures? That's all fallen apart. A lot of people now fear the Catholic Church. And they always fear them, the authority and all that. But the, the abuse, the child abuse, and all of this, the cover-ups... Who's going to respect that? So even that now, you know, a lot of even even Christian people doubt some of the leaders because of that. And I'm not saying that's necessarily right or wrong, but there's like no higher authority to go to. Some people feel all at sea because of that. And don't you think it's interesting that our sacred spaces of the last 2,000 years, which are wonderful pieces of architecture, they're, they're now really increasingly seen by here in Britain, especially as kind of museum pieces, nice art, but that's it. Whereas meanwhile, the other sacred spaces have quietly replaced them, and they are our shopping centres. Uh -huh. Mammon is the new god. It is no accident that shopping centres are built to look like cathedrals. Because they know from all the research they've done that you're in a different state of mind in these huge environments that make you buy, that make you feel in awe. That's not an accident. So our new cathedrals are now the cathedrals to materialism. Rudolf Steiner, who was a very interesting German mystic, in the early 20th century wrote that he thought the British were the bearers of the consciousness soul. Okay? that he thought we carried a lot for the human race. And he then also pointed out that because of that, we were prime targets to be corrupted by materialism. And he writes at length how secret societies plan to bring down the spiritual energy of the British because they, you know, the opposition knew what we really should represent. So maybe it's time to start to reclaim this, to really be the bearers of the consciousness soul and stop being distracted by all the things that have sucked us away for so long. Other people look for other solutions. I mean, in the New Age world, many people are waiting for, you know, the Ashtar Command or the Ascended Masters to come and rescue them if stuff starts to kick off with planetary changes and all of this. And I can't say these people don't exist, but my concern when I hear people give their all to this is they're just waiting. They're not doing anything. They're just saying, I'll be rescued. The Christian evangelicals have got the same phenomenon. It's like, it doesn't matter, I'll go up on the rapture. I don't need to do anything to change things now. That's worrying. It concerns me because at the end of the day, that energy of waiting. You know, if Christ were to come back today, and uh, you said to him, oh, well, I'm so glad you're here, and I knew you were coming, so I did nothing. Do you think you'd go with that? I don't think so. I think a lot is being asked of us, and we haven't realised it. And, you know, also in the kind of New Age mystical world, some are waiting for Maitreya. You know, allegedly this being is going to come back and lead the world into the new golden age. There's loads of these figures that may or may not come back. And I'm not ridiculing people's belief in these. But what concerns me is that what they all miss is they're all asking somebody else to put it right. That's not going to work in my personal view. In my personal view, you and me and everybody are the only people that are going to put this right. And to do that, we've got to start taking some responsibility. Because too often, and you know, the alternative world is very guilty of this, and I include myself in that, we blame others. It's them, it's the opposition, it's the ruling elite, it's whoever it is, the Zionists, the Jesuits, it's them, it's them, they're doing it to us. Well, yes, they are, but guess why? Because we've let them do it. We are responsible for the world that we live in. And we are responsible for what's happened. Because everybody stood up tomorrow and said we've had enough. Of course it would end. And there's an awful lot of evidence that that's the case. And there's an awful lot of evidence that what we all collectively think changes the world. Check out the works of Dean Radin. One particular good book, Entangled Minds. He categorically shows that there is experiment after experiment that shows that collective consciousness changes the world. He was one of those who pioneered what they call the Global Consciousness Project. And they've now realized when lots of people focus their minds on the same thing at the same time, they can make computers react without any physical connection. But when we collectively focus intent, we are changing the energetic environment around us. Many people believe this could be used to create a different world. 
And if you want to know more about that kind of stuff, read Lynn McTaggart's The Field. Very good evidence that this is a real phenomenon. Match that with positive action of the kind, you know, if you like, encouraged by people like Michael Moore. It doesn't matter what you think about his politics. He has some interesting ideas, which is you should all take some responsibility. He says, if you don't like what your local council is doing, get on the local council. If you don't like you know, what's going on in your town, get up and do something. Be involved. Because part of the problem is that the governments that run our country, okay, the governments that run our country are projections of us. Okay? But what we do is we say, right, that's enough. We don't need to do anything more. We'll leave them to run with it. And of course, what happens? What happens is we wind up with governments we don't like because we don't want to get involved. And so the people that want power continually get to the top because we're too apathetic or have become trained to be apathetic um, to do anything about it. This Simon Cowell, who for all his faults has pointed out, isn't it interesting, that in recent times, right, the governments have been voted in for less by less people than who regularly vote for the X Factor every week. Mm. Think about that. So more people each week will vote for a singer or some whatever than will actually go out and vote for a government. Doesn't that tell you an awful lot about how disillusioned we've become with those in power? He says that maybe now we've got the internet and all of this, and there's a lot of issues around electronic voting, but that we should start to influence politics more. There was that attempt to do that, wasn't there, recently, by if you all, you know, tick this box on the government website, they will have a discussion about it. Now they're trying to shuffle back from that. But ultimately, he's pointed out, why shouldn't half the decisions, or all the decisions, actually be made by all of us? Instead of relying on 600 people that never represent us, they represent the lobbyists. They represent the arms dealers. They represent what they're told to by the whip. The, the government whip system, I think, is an outrage. They, because they cannot represent what we want them to represent. So the whole thing is meaningless. But he's saying, look, the new technology is such that in a hundred years' time, you know, maybe even on a jury service basis, some of us, all of us, could in some way collectively participate in these decisions. Because that way, we can't keep blaming everybody else for what's wrong. We're all a part of it. And maybe that's the only way to avoid decisions we don't like. Look at what happens in history when people stand up for themselves collectively and they focus their intent. They can have an incredible effect. And this gives us great encouragement for these times ahead, I believe. I mean, you can argue, for instance, that peace protests or anti-war, depending on what you want to call them, don't work. Because you could argue they've still got atomic weapons and, you know, the huge protests against the Iraq war in 2003, well, we still went to war in Iraq. But others argue this back the other way and they say, yeah, but you could say that, for instance, had people not made their feelings known about Iraq as strongly as they did, maybe we would have been bombing Iran three years ago. Okay. which you may or may not think is a good thing. But the fact is, they need our consent on some level. That's what the weapons of mass destruction debacle was, was about. They needed to twist our consent, or as Noam Chomsky would say, to manufacture our consent. Okay, And it's true, they do. They can't just go ahead and do anything they want. They have to feel we're on their side, which is why they have to manipulate us. That gives us great power. Um, I mean, if you look at another thing, genetically modified food has been held back massively in this country by enough people standing up and saying no. Now, it's coming in through the back door, through things like the Codex and all the rest of it, but it has been greatly held back by enough people standing the ground and saying we don't support this. On a very little level, the campaign for real ale has saved many independent pubs and breweries from going down the pan by standing up for the little man and mounting campaigns. Shame it takes alcohol to galvanise them, but nonetheless, you know, there is a sign here that when people act together, it works. Look at history. The Berlin Wall, some people say, yeah, but that was all a big manipulation anyway, because it was convenient for the wall to come down by this point. Well, yeah, that's probably true. But it was still the people that made it happen as fast as it did. Because when they realised that the authorities were just beginning to weaken, that's when they took power into their own hands and collectively stood on the wall and said, enough's enough. And I think it happened far more quickly and in ways that were not expected. 
because people decided to rise above their fear and the minute they knew they weren't going to get shot dead on the top or that they were willing to take the risk, of course, everything changed. The suffragette movement is a very good example of something happening that basically, where people took their own lives into their own hands, they stuck their heads above the parapet, and through this, they managed to get votes, not just for women, but for lots of minorities that had not previously had them. Women got beaten up and raped, and it was horrendous. But they kept going, and they didn't give up. And in the end, it changed the world. You now have the problem where you probably don't know who to vote for, all right? But at least you have a vote. And today, in some parts of the world, people are dying just to get a vote and still being denied it. But we at least have that here. Now, some Mandela. Was he a terrorist? Wasn't he a terrorist? Don't know. But the fact is that after all those years of incarceration, you wouldn't have thought that he would have suddenly become the president of South Africa so soon. No one saw that coming. The reason it happened was that there was a focus of global consciousness on the issue, on his case. And the government was shamed into releasing him. And it changed a lot of things for all the problems they may still have in South Africa. Solidarity in Poland, they stood against the communist oppression. They were not meant to have a union, but they insisted on having a union. And they stood their ground and they went through a lot of difficulty, but in the end it worked. And they wound up forming the basis of the first democratic government Poland had had in years. Because they stood their ground and they stood against fear as well. Live Aid, he can be cynical about charity gigs and all the rest of it, but it did show that when enough people just decide to do something, they can do it. The governments were shamed by this. They weren't doing enough for poverty and all the rest of it. And just a bunch of rock stars, whatever you think of them today, just thought, hey, let's just do something. And it became a global phenomenon that I think did send a very positive ripple around the world. And I think we can learn some lessons for that. And one of the other lessons is, though, you don't let it get abused. But it still was a step in the right direction. And change comes often when you least expect it. Northern Ireland, for instance, you would never have thought that the troubles could have ended. And okay, there's still a little bit of stuff today. But essentially, we're in different times. You wouldn't have thought, even two years before this, that you would ever see Paisley and Adams sitting at a desk together smiling. You could not have seen that coming. Okay? But it had to happen. And it was right that it happened. And it happened because enough people decided, actually, enough's enough. Yes, somewhere in the background there's always manipulation. You can't avoid that. That's our world. But you look in the eyes of the people, the normal people, and you can see what they really want. And ultimately, most people wanted this. And it worked. And they got it. Now, the bottom line is this. If we are puppets of elites, okay, Whoever they may be, whatever they may be, it is because we collectively allow it to happen. It's true. So yes, there are problems with that group and that group and that person, but at the end of the day, we've got to claw that back, stop blaming others and reshape our own lives. Take responsibility, try to take more collective responsibility, but change ourselves. If we don't like something in somebody else, you can bet your life it's because it's in us too. It's what they call psychological projection. You have to look at your own life and look at the way you live your life. Are you living in the way you want your authorities to live? If you're not, change it. Because that's when the domino effect comes in. And you've got to talk to people about all this stuff. Whatever you're concerned about, risk it. Risk it at the office. Risk it in the bus queue. Say, hey, you know, I've been reading this and uh, have you thought of this? What is amazing to me, and I give talks to a lot of groups, often mainstream groups, like WI and Rotary Clubs, that actually you share this kind of stuff with them and they're not as resistant to it as you think. And often people will say, yeah, now you mention it, yeah, it's kind of what I've always thought. But they often don't feel they can say it because they're afraid of being shot down. They're afraid of being attacked and that, that fear holds it down. When they see other people openly discussing this, that's when everything changes. Okay, so you've got to rise above the fear. And I thought it really interesting that behind me, was this quote up on here. Because even before I saw that, I was going to end this talk on this quote from Mr. Gandhi. So funnily enough, there it is, been stuck behind me all night. Famous quote, but it's worth restating, okay? This is what Gandhi said. 
He said, when I despair, I remember that all through history, the ways of truth and love have always won. There have been tyrants and murderers, and for a time, they can seem invincible. But in the end, they always fall. Remember that, always. And it's true. So I hope that what I've done this evening is to share with you a few threads. Many of you would have been aware of these threads, of course. But that if it in some way has helped focus it, so that when you come out of here, and you're out and about tomorrow, that you can somehow live the issues that you're concerned about in a positive way. And with human compassion, I think it's really vital. Well, then I hope that it will have achieved something. It will have achieved something. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for listening.